Hello, Broken Arrow. This is the Vibe Broken Arrow, and I am Aaron McCulloch with the communications team here for the city. And this is Chief Jeremy Moore with Broken Arrow Fire Department. It's the first time he's ever been on the hot seat on the Vibe Broken Arrow. We appreciate you uh, sacrificing and coming up here and answering these really tough questions about BAFD. Yeah, glad to be here. Kind of trial by fire. There, hey, dad joke for you. Yeah, <laughs> well, got done. those all day. I'm telling you, you got to look for dad jokes to make the day go by, right? Yeah, exactly. Hey, so let's talk real quick. Uh, I want to go back to earlier this year. We had a comprehensive citizen survey that went out. Fire department got some really strong marks and overall safety, feeling of safety in BA. Now, this was all of the public safety services that we have from sure. what your team does, police department, emergency management. That was 83% positive. People just, they really feel safe in Broken Arrow. But I want to trickle it down just a little bit more, do a little bit deeper dive. Ambulance and medical services got 87% positive. Fire services, 91% positive. Fantastic remarks. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, really proud of our men and women on the front line. Do a fantastic job. And we just see them continue to raise their commitment levels to training. You know, uh, our goal is to never have a fire or a medical emergency in the city, which just makes us kind of a expensive insurance policy. But what really makes our, our department uh, attain those levels of uh, excellence are the day in, day out preparations they do in case there is a fire or medical emergency. Uh, routinely, they're at the training center doing training. Our companies are doing regular drills at the fire stations and so forth. The training division is is going out, getting the newest, latest, greatest techniques, bringing them back and introducing them to our department. So the men and women on the front lines and their commitment to this community is what helped us achieve those high marks. You talk about regular training. So whenever they're not out fighting fires or helping with a medical emergency, I would imagine there's some kind of training that's going on back at the station. Yeah. Super proud of our, our men and women on the front line, our firefighters, because in the last uh, nine years, we've seen training kind of move from a, a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to seven days a week now. Oh, no kidding. And so I get kind of notifications on my phone seven days a week of what's going on in the city. And it's routinely seven days a week, an hour here, an hour there, three or four hours here or there. The companies are initiating it uh, on their own, where previously, like I said, nine years ago, the, the department, the training center would it would initiate training, require you to be there. You had to be there on this day at this time, and then that would be the end of it. Now we're seeing seven days a week, the company officers uh, in the fire stations are saying, I want to do this today. Let's go out and get it done in the field. And, oh, let's partner up with this, this fire station across town. And so we're seeing a very organic grassroots uh, training um initiative going on across the department on all three shifts. It's, it's, it's really great to see. And it's what really uh, prepares them for, the, for any f emergency that this city faces. Oh, that's fantastic. And it's such a, a sense of security for the community to know that they're honing their skills and trying to get better and knowing that they just, they haven't hit that top level and that's it. They're trying to continue to move on. Every day is, is a commitment and dedication to, to being better at, at, at our craft, what we do. And it, you know, we're also learning techniques and skills, mm -hmm. but it's the teamwork that really helps us rise above above the rest, you know, and um, learning to work with each other, developing that level of camaraderie, knowing what you're thinking before you ask for it and those mm -hmm. types of things. So it's not just technical proficiencies, but teamwork proficiencies, mm -hmm. like a, a professional athletic team, you know, you don't get good at uh, playing football unless you practice football. Yeah, you got to have that chemistry. Yeah, you exactly, gotta, exactly. You got to be able to work together. You have to know what your what your colleague is going to be doing, where right. they're going to be, that sort of thing. Right. Makes total sense. You know, one of the other things that the, um, the citizens said that they wanted us to focus on as far as overall safety over the, the next two years, 93% strongly supported that statement. And what I can really appreciate is the fact that you have all of this success as far as the perception of the fire department. Mm -hmm. You're not resting on those laurels. You all already have some things in place in the works that has been in the works prior to that survey going out. And one of the first ones I want to talk about, and that's that SAFER grant. This was just approved uh, by city council earlier, um, about a month or so ago. This is a $2.9 million grant. Tell me what you're going to use it for, that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm glad you asked because there's kind of been some misunderstandings I've seen on some social media stuff going, why didn't they use the grant money for this project or that project or this grant money from FEMA federal grant could only be used for the staffing of firefighters. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the city couldn't have used it for stormwater projects or the city couldn't have used it for other recovery projects. It's not residual money left over from some disaster. This is new money distributed across the United States just for hiring and staffing uh, fire departments. And so it will be used just for that purposes here. Uh, we will be hiring 12 firefighters above and beyond our current authorized level. And those firefighters will go through our traditional academy, they'll get all the traditional equipment, and those costs will be borne by the city. But the salaries and benefits for those 12 firefighters will be picked up by the federal government for three years. And so that's where you get the two point, almost $9 million. Yep. And so those are federal dollars coming back into our community. Yeah. That's, Super, that's really big time. Very excited about that. You know, we're getting our piece of that federal pie coming back home here. You know, we're all paying taxes and it's nice to see uh, the fruits of our labor being spent right here at home. Not the first time you all have gotten this grant either. True. Very proud of that. In the last nine years, this is actually the third time we've uh, received one of these federal SAFER grants. It's the biggest one we've received. The prior two, I think in 2015, 16, 17, somewhere in that range, we've received two prior ones. Uh, they were a little bit uh, fewer firefighters. I think nine firefighters in the first one in 15, 11 firefighters in the second one in 16, but those only funded two years worth of salaries respectively. Hmm. This one actually uh, does three full years worth of salaries, which is fantastic. And it's also for 12 firefighters. So it's the longest time frame and the most firefighters we've been able to hire using one of these grants. So when do you anticipate seeing these 12 new firefighters come on? Because it's, I would imagine it's not one of those things where you just hire them and they start working and you train them. I would imagine they have to go through the academy and there's probably a chance that some of them are going to fall off and you're going to have to bring in more. When do you anticipate them coming on board? Uh, that's that's a, a great question. We've already been in the process of hiring just due to normal attrition. And so we probably uh, would have had an academy class starting in January of 2025 for between six and eight firefighters just due to normal attrition. Now with this, we're looking at an academy class of 16 to 20 because of normal attrition plus these 12. So uh, later today, we're actually gonna be making the final selections for the next Academy class. That's exciting. Yeah, a little bit of excitement. Yeah. There's gonna be some folks out there I told them we would make notifications by Halloween. So we're gonna be uh, making those final selections today and uh, make, making some people really thrilled about uh, the next phases here. But January of 2025 is when we'll start the Academy. You know, that's interesting. Uh, just sit there and you, you think back to, you know, those times when you get that call after you've applied for a job and you get that notification that you've been selected for that position. How is it for you and oh. your leadership team to be able to tell somebody, hey, guess what? Your career is beginning with the AFD. Yeah. One, one of the best things I get to do as, as the fire chief is picking the right people to come work for us and making promotions. Two of my favorite things to get to do because we're shaping the future of the community and we're trying to find the right people that espouse the values of the city of Broken Arrow and, and our elected officials. What are the values of this community? And as we go and we find those people and we're plugging them into the department, there's nothing more gratifying than, and I personally make every one of those calls to say, Yes, you're coming to join us. Are you ready to join our team? Are you, you know, and, and it's it's extremely gratifying uh, portion of the job to get to make those calls and pick the people that are going to be the future leaders because uh, at the City of Broken Arrow, the longevity of our employees is pretty significant. And especially in the fire service, we're picking people today that I believe will be here two to three decades from now. And so knowing that we get to do that is really fun. And the fire service, you know, having a job in the Broken Arrow Fire Department, we tell them is absolutely like winning the lottery. Uh, the community here supports public safety immensely. Uh, we compensate our employees very, very well. And we we literally believe it's like winning the lottery to get to come work here at the city of Broken Arrow, especially at the fire department. What's that like to see one of those folks that you call and you tell them that you know we're bringing you on board, you watch them through the academy, then you see them out in the field, whether you know, firefighter, paramedic, that sort of thing, and watch that career progression. Every single employee that we've hired, we get to build personal relationships with. And it's fun to, you know, go there on day one and see the the surprise in their eye or the fear in their eyes of what's getting ready to happen. Because we run a paramilitary style organization overall, which starts with a kind of a paramilitary style boot camp at the beginning. And, you know, the, the, the fear in their eyes is there, but it, to watch them grow and learn and, and those types of things. And you're sitting there with a brand new group of 
18, 19, 20, sometimes 30-year-old young men and women knowing they're going to replace me one of these days. They're going to be in this. They all have the potential to be here as the fire chief, to be in the city leadership here doing this for years to come and to watch them grow and learn and uh, continue really to develop the culture of the department, you know, uh, as we bring on these young men and women and then watch them promote and have the pride and ownership for the, the for my own people that I hired you, watch the great things you're doing, get the uh, compliments from the citizens come, you know, via whatever communication style on Facebook. Hey, I know so-and-so. They did a great job. They took care of my mom. They put out my house fire, whatever that is, and to, and to connect with those people and then get the opportunity later to promote them to lieutenant and captain and so forth. It's been very gratifying. Yeah, well, it's so admirable, too, when you think of uh, they're committed to putting others before themselves. And that was never more apparent to me than this last year. You and I had the pleasure of being part of the Leadership Broken Arrow uh, career development program. And one of those days was Public Safety Day. And we got to go out and see your firefighters do a training session in that, what, three-story structure, I think. A drill tower, yeah. And just seeing the firefighters hanging out of the windows, that black smoke billowing out and they're trying to bring somebody up the side or lower them down to the ground. I have a fear of heights. <laughs> I have a fear of fire. And my knees were knocking while I'm watching the whole thing. I had to look down a couple of different times. I mean, that fearlessness and, like I said, just putting others before themselves is just so admirable that it's just beyond words. Yeah, very. I, I can't reiterate enough how proud we are of, of our men and women and and the sacrifices they're willing to make on a daily basis to, to to better our community and to make sure that we are the you know one of the safest communities in the United States. Yeah, you talked about shaping the community, making the community safer, that sort of thing. One of your other initiatives is a new fire station, fire station number eight. Yeah. From what I understand, it's it's being designed right now. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we're in ongoing design meetings. The fire station eight was a 2018 bond issue. The voters said, we're growing. The community is growing. Public safety has got to grow with it. We need more streets. We need more infrastructure. And public safety is part of that infrastructure. And so we had studies done that said which direction is the community growing, where are our, our response times uh, lagging. We want to get a fire station to every house uh, within a, a four to five minute drive time of every fire station in town. So we noticed that up in the northeast portion of the city, up by our training center, was an area that our response times were exceeding four or five minutes. They were pushing in some areas as much as 10 minutes. The voters said, let's get another fire station built. And we knew that was the location to do it. And so we're in regular design meetings with our architects to uh, make sure we're putting the right fire station together for that area of town and the future growth. So what does that look like? Because you said you had one of those meetings right before you came here to meet with us today. So what is that process like with the the design team as far as putting it together? What do you have to do? Yeah, so we've built, a, we've you know, had the opportunities, again, the citizens and the great public support for us. We've had the opportunity to build a couple of fire stations in the last few years, replacing some older fire stations. But um, so we've learned some lessons from building the prior two stations. And so we started the design process by bringing in the fire stations uh, bringing in the firefighters at the two most recently built fire stations. That's say, three and seven. Fire station three and seven um, brought in the firefighters assigned to that station at all different ranks, different genders, because we've got men and women in the front line staying 24 hours at the station together, brought them in and sat down and said, all right, what works and what doesn't work in these two last designs? Interestingly enough, we're using the same architect for the last two for this one. Um, and so we're moving forward with that project. And we brought them in as firefighters and said, what do we like? What do we don't like? And we began to talk about it. And then we took that information to the architects. As a matter of fact, in that, that meeting, the architects sat down with us and listened to it all. And they went back and they made a draft and then brought us a set of plans. And we said, we like this, we like this. I know we said we thought we'd like this, but now we thought about it more and we don't like that. And a uh, matter of fact, uh, sought input from some other communities. A few years ago, we took a trip, uh, best practices trip to Greenville, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I built some relationships there. And actually, they sent us some conceptual drawings and, and plans that they had for a fire station with some, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to balance um, privacy with camaraderie and team building in the fire stations. And so there's a, there's a few unique aspects when you've got men and women working in the same environment, sleeping together, eating together, working out together, and how to make that work to uh, give privacy, but also um, encourage team building 
And that's very important. We work as a team. And so we've had a lot of conversations, but it's a lot of them putting prints down, marking out what it is. And today was the painstaking process of getting exactly what we wanted on mm. the prints and realizing this is it. So you're at that stage now. You, you've seen what it's going to look like potentially? Or did you go through and red mark some things? Ex they brought today, I think, exactly what we wanted and what we liked, minus a, a door here, a door there. And then we realized it was a million dollars potentially over budget. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Can exactly I be part of that conversation whenever you go, whenever you go to your bosses? Well, we're, we're not going to be asking for a million more dollars. <laughs> so uh, the citizens gave us uh, right at five and a half million dollars. But to build a fire station that we know is going to be here in 2050 and beyond serving the needs of our community, it, we really have to think long term. And how do we... Um, buy land, uh, you know, acquire land, design the station, build the station, take care of all the, the water retention and runoff to make Mr. Schwab happy, of course. Uh, Our assistant city manager of operations. Yes, I'm sure he's probably been uh, on the hot seat here, but how do we roll all of that together and stay within the, the dollars that the city gave us, knowing that uh, construction, uh, construction prices are skyrocketing, mm -hmm but we can't cut corners on what we think the city will need in 2050 because this is our one shot to get it right for the next two or three generations of uh, not just firefighters, but for the city as it grows. So we're going to try to squeeze everything we can out of the five and a half million dollars that the, the citizens said, build another fire station in the northeast portion of town. So we're going back and trying to value engineer, uh, cut a few corners here, cut off a little bit of square foot from the um, Taj Mahal that we said we wanted and what they brought to us to what uh, we can absolutely um, build and get by with and it will accommodate the growth of the, the firefighters and the community in the future. And just to clarify, when you say cut corners, that's not compromising the emergency medical services that you provide. No, absolutely that's not. That's just with that building. And, and we're not going to compromise the safety of our firefighters in the structure. We're, and, and, you know, we're not going to compromise those safety features that are necessary to prevent cancer for our firefighters. And this is their home for a third of their uh, life as, as in the workforce. And so we're not going to cut those corners. We're going to make sure all those safety features are still in place. But instead of having this big of a bedroom, we can get by with this big of a bedroom. Instead of having potentially four apparatus bays that we know would be ideal for future growth, we may have to just have three apparatus bays. Or today we talked about instead of the bays being 70 feet deep to accommodate um, maybe doubling up apparatus, they may be only be 50 feet deep. And every little thing that we are willing to uh, make a little bit smaller, square footage costs money. And yeah, it so, does. But we can still get everything we would need. Uh, we just may have to make some decisions on not everything we want. That's right. I mean, we all know about that. Right. It's, it's, it's no different uh, for our home budgets as it is for our work budgets. That's right. Do you have a goal in mind as far as when you want to see this station open and firefighters in it? Yeah, it, it's never as quick as what we'd like. Yep. I'd love to have that fire station opened already. But we believe it will take about a year for the design phase mm -hmm. that we're probably about six months into that now. Okay. So around uh, early next summer, I think the design will be done and completed. Then uh, we don't actually have the bonds sold yet for the fire station. And the earliest that the bonds would sell would be next year. So potentially we could get money in hand in 2026 mm -hmm. to build the station, have a year of construction, open the station sometime late in 2027 would be the ideal scenario. Yep. And that makes sense, you know, because those bonds, we have to sell them each year from those voter, from that voter approved election back in 2018. Right. And so we don't just have that $211 million right then from whenever that election was, was approved right. and got the yes vote. We have to sell those bonds each of the 10 years, essentially, and to, to get usually, that money. And the sale usually happens late in the year, November, December time mm -hmm. frame. So even when I say we're going to sell those bonds next year, to have the money in hand really is going to be early 26. That's right. Yep, because it won't be sold until the fourth quarter of next year. Right. Uh, let's talk about something else that's really interesting, and this is new for this fiscal year. You've partnered with, Broken Arrow Fire Department has, has 
partnered with Family and Children's Services. And this is to help provide some more resources, of course, when it comes to mental health and substance abuse issues. Talk about that. What, it, what exactly is this program? Right. So our, we've rolled out a partnership with Family and Children's Services because while our frontline men and women do an excellent job of fighting fires and providing emergency medical care. And emergency medical care, a lot of people probably don't know it. I mean, we're called the fire department, but emergency medical care is about 80% of what we do. We're actually responding to most of the times that the fire trucks and ambulances are rolling out of the station. About 80% of the time, it's for someone that has a medical need. So coupled with that, our primary solution for our citizens is taken to the emergency room. Ambulance transport, we're going to take them to the emergency room, whether it's a heart attack or a car wreck or whatever. That's our primary solution uh, as the fire department is to take folks to the emergency room. But we continue to see, and, and all across the United States, but right here at home in Broken Arrow, we're continuing to see people need some other solutions. And us taking them to uh, these other solutions, it could be um, homelessness that is creating their their need to call emergency services, or it could be malnourishment. They, they just need a meal. Could be uh, a need that they are starting to reach out to emergency services, or maybe it's substance abuse, or there's a mental health issue. Different things that when you don't know who to call, that's us. Dial 911. That's why we're here to help. And but we began to realize we were getting these calls for services. Help me. I need some help with something. Mm -hmm. But we didn't really have a great solution except take them to the emergency room. And that's not always the best fit. No. Right. Mm -hmm. Take them to the emergency room or put out the fire. We're really the, what we're in our, what we call our, our toolbox. Yep. The tools we have to be able to serve our public. And it's not always the right solution. Someone that needs um, some mental health intervention the emergency room is not the right place. Mm -hmm. Someone who needs a meal or a, a or a shelter, you know, a roof over their head, and we don't have a, a problem with homelessness in the community. Don't get me wrong, but there are things where where we just didn't have the solutions. Family and Children's Services is helping us bridge that gap. They are a nonprofit who work in the community in those areas that don't already have governmental services. Mm -hmm. They're connected with other nonprofits to provide different uh, mechanisms, different tools for citizens with these needs that we're not traditionally set up to, to help out with. And so Family and Children's Services has provided a counselor, from what I understand, to be with your teams and, and going out when those calls come in. What does that person's role look like? So they have provided what we call a navigator. Okay. We've, we, you use the term counselor, and that's, that's a portion of it, I would say. Uh, the navigator is embedded in our offices. So it's a family and children's services employee. Uh, they're like a subcontractor for the city. They are in our offices, but they use their family and children's services uh, computers. But, and they're, they work for family and children's services, but the city of Broken Arrow via the fire department does have a contract with them and that navigator sits down on a regular basis daily or weekly with my frontline personnel with my ems division and says all right what's going on in the community well we responded to this person today and they were having a, a mental crisis and we're not sure how to deal with that family and children's services says we know how to deal with that that, that's exactly what we do. And they step in and, and make a house visit. They'll, so they'll pair up with one of my firefighters and they'll go to that residence and they'll begin to have a conversation. How can we help you today? What's that look like? So instead of us showing up with an ambulance that costs a lot of money and then taking them to the hospital, uh, the navigator shows up and, and begins to have a conversation. Firefighters are right there on the scene with them. So if it did escalate into a medical need, we can take them mm -hmm. to the to the ER, but if there's other programs that they can be plugged into, uh, they're there for that. Do you have any stories of success success that you want to share from this program? Uh, sure. I mean, I know it's only been going on for a couple of months, but yeah, we, we started it just right <laughs> at July first, and some of the stories are just as simple as. Uh, someone couldn't get their medications. And so this program helped them get medications, which keeps them at home rather than having to go to the ER and those types of things for, for a need. Um, other individuals had some 
challenges living on their own. Mm -hmm. And so we've connected them with home health and we've connected them with services that can come out and help them live on their own due to whatever their own uh, situation is, their own environmental factors, their own deteriorating health conditions of an aging population or, or existing uh, medical conditions. They don't need to go to the ER every time they have something, but they do need some assistance around the house. Um, there's been a couple places where uh, our firefighters have worked closely and tried to get uh, our firefighters go out and do what we call a lift assist. I just need assistance out of bed into here. And a lot of times we think, well, that doesn't happen in our private residences. That only happens in nursing homes. But there's a kind of a gap between needing full-time care in a nursing home and I still want to have autonomy. None of us want to ever go to a nursing home. But there's a time and a season for that. And before that time and season is, is obvious or absolutely required, we all want to stay living in our own homes. And so sometimes that gap is, is filled by uh, the emergency services. And it's really not what we're intended to do because if we're busy doing that, then it pulls us away from being able to respond to higher. And it's not, it's still a need. It's not to minimize. It's anything. not to minimize. It's still a need and it's still something we do, but it, it takes us away from being able to respond to a car wreck or cardiac arrest or a fire. And we're still glad to help out and do that. But there are other programs that specifically do that and the navigators jump in and that's where they can help make that happen. Yeah, it sounds like this is a program that not only meets some of the needs, meets the needs of some of our community, but it also provides for some greater efficiency within your department too. It does. It does. Because the navigator can pair up with uh, one of my one of my other firefighters instead of sending a million dollar fire truck with four firefighters on it to go assist a citizen who just needed a little helping hand, I can send uh, the navigator and one firefighter out there in, in a pickup truck and they stop by and check on them and get them the help they need. So it's a, it's a good use of resources. Fantastic program. Um, let's talk about that ISO one rating just real quick. You see it on the side of the truck? What does that mean? So the ISO rating is, is a rating that insurance companies use to determine the, 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 basically the fire service or the protection levels of the community, of our fire department in our city. And so the ISO rating uh, ranges from one to 10, one's the best. And, a few and years, we would expect nothing less. Right, a few years ago, uh, we did the things that were required and got reevaluated. And it's, it's not an overnight process. It takes years of continuing to do training. It takes years of um, staffing the department as it should be. They evaluate the water system. They evaluate the dispatch system. And so when you think about the ISO rating of one, it's not just looking at the fire department. It's most commonly associated with the fire department. But it's the entire city, the entire city team working together without water coming out of the hydrants appropriately, we don't get an ISO rating of one. Without the dispatch and communications team not dispatching in an appropriate manner, we don't get an ISO rating of one. So there's multiple entities all working together to make sure from the training department to the police department to the dispatchers to the water department, the streets department, all working together to make us uh, have an ISO rating of one. And what that means is those insurance companies say, oh, you've got an ISO rating of one, you qualify for lower homeowners insurance premiums because of that. And so we're able to save every homeowner in town significant money on their insurance premiums because of the dedication that we've got from the community on having a great fire department and all those other departments that are complementary to that. Oh, we should certainly appreciate you all maintaining that rating and continuing to present that to us so that we can save some money. Yeah, it's That's great fantastic. Deal. Yeah. How can we follow what Broken Arrow Fire Department is doing? I know you have a Facebook page, but you also have Pulse Point app. What is that? Yeah, we're on the social media now. Uh, uh, we've had a Facebook page for a while, but we've really done And that's a our great way to see what you what your teams are doing, and not just as far as emergency medical services are, are concerned, fire protection and that sort of thing, but the outreach and the education that you're doing. It's a great way to follow it as well. Yeah, we kind of had an ad hoc approach for many years to our social media presence. And this year, we've got a dedicated person now to it. And so you've seen uh, 
now we're on Instagram and we're on uh, X or Twitter, mm -hmm. but we're doing a, a lot stronger effort on Facebook to let the community know what we're doing day in and day out. And so it's a great way to get engaged uh, with the Broken Arrow Fire Department. And we all often put on community CPR classes and we'll push that information out. When's the next CPR class going to be? It's great for babysitters, but it's also great for uh, our fellow citizens because while we respond in four or five minutes, as I said earlier, every minute you go without receiving CPR, your chances of survival drop by 10%. <laughs> so citizen CPR is the critical link between to surviving a cardiac arrest incident. So not only do we want you to know CPR and we'll train you in it, but we want you to have our Pulse Point app downloaded because Pulse Point lets everybody know it's a free app for anybody in the city and it lets you know kind of what's going on, but it also will alert citizens of a need of CPR nearby their location. And so we encourage everybody to learn CPR, be willing to do it. These days it's not uh, breaths, it's hands on the chest, doing compressions uh, to help out your fellow neighbor. And the better uh, CPR going on before we arrive, the more chances you are of surviving cardiac arrest incident. Great conversation. Appreciate all the insight and a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Chief. I enjoyed it. Yeah, we'll bring you back again. I'd love to come back. Thank you. The Vibe Broken Arrow is produced by the City of Broken Arrow. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to hear more about Broken Arrow, the city where opportunity lives.